Hello, and welcome to a short box from Warhammer 40K's Grim History from the Beyond. I'm Zekthar, and today we'll be doing a special box on Catriona Greyfax, Inquisitor of the Ordo Hereticus. <clears throat> now, if you've listened to our program before, Greyfax is not an unusual name to you. Greyfax was, in fact, part of the Ultramar campaign box that we did a while back, as well as Cadia Stands. If you have the time after this one, by all means, use the links to listen. But this takes place after the Ultramar campaign, and not long after Gilliman's installation as Lowell Commander of the Imperium. Now, after he reclaimed his title, Rebute summoned Catriana Greyfax to the Hall of Glories in the Imperial Palace. She found him studying the records of the Inquisition, and he explained that there was much that was not yet understood about the Great Rift, the massive warp rift that had cut the Imperium in half in the wake of the 13th Black Crusade. The Primarch noted that it was very similar to the Rune Storm that had been summoned by his brother Lorgar during the time of the Horus Heresy, though the Great Rift eclipsed the size and scope of the Rune Storm by several orders of magnitude. Gilliman explained that in the birth of the Great Rift, he had seen a pattern. It was similar to that of the workings of the ancient servants of Chaos, such as the priests of Davin, the world where Horus had first been turned to the service of the Dark Gods. The Primarch explained that he had followed the spore of this pattern back through the Inquisition's records, and though he had found no solution to the problem of the Great Rift, he had discovered where to begin looking. To the era of the Gothic War, almost a thousand standard years before. One of Greyfax's counterparts from that time, Inquisitor Horst, believed that two Xenos artifacts were taken from the worlds of the Gothic Sector just before the start of the Gothic War to aid Abaddon, the Hand of Darkness, and the Eye of Night. A Greyfax recognized the names, but cautioned the Lord Commander that Horst was considered a maverick within the Inquisition, and that these suppositions were nothing more than undocumented speculation. Gilman countered somewhat pointedly, that Horst's speculation was the only real clue they possessed as to how Abaddon seized control of the Blackstone Fortresses and the Gothic Sector during the Twelfth Black Crusade. The Primarch explained that he needed to know more about what Horst had found. Gilman ordered Greyfax to go to the Gothic Sector, to the remains of the Cardinal World of Savavin, which had been destroyed along with its 14 billion inhabitants by Abaddon's planet killer during the Gothic War. Greyfax protested that the secret inquisitorial fortress that had been laying low below the cathedrals of Savavin had been destroyed along with the planet and it was unlikely any records remained. But Gilliman believed that Savavin's destruction had been no random accident. It was likely that the despoiler had learned of the existence of the Inquisition base on that world and that he had deliberately destroyed it to prevent Horst from moving against his plans in the sector. The Lord Commander cautioned Greyfax that he was not sending her to Savavin to recover Horst's records. She was to bring him the Eye of Night. When she asked about the Hand of Darkness, the Primarch responded only that he had other plans in motion to secure its recovery. And so, off Greyfax went, arriving in the Gothic Sector over the fractured ruins of what once had been the Cardinal's world of Savavin and the Imperial warship Malleus Rex. The vessel was commanded by Justicar Genhein, and his accompanying squad of Grey Knights, a necessary honor guard for the Inquisitor as the Gothic Sector had been almost swallowed by the Great Rift. From the moment they took up position over the planetary fragments, Greyfax sensed the presence of an old psychic beacon among the shattered rock fragments of Savavin, opening her mind to Genhan to boost her already potent psychic abilities with those of the Justicar. Greyfax determined that the psychic trace had indeed been left by Horst, though it contained no message other than an old taste of great haste and fear. As Greyfax broke her contact with the beacon, another void ship, a frigate, burst into real space from the warp above the fragments of Savavin. Greyfax ordered the Malleus Rex to attack the much less powerful newcomer and destroy it, while she, Genhan, and the rest of his squad of Grey Knights teleported down into the ruins of the Ecclesiarchy Cathedral on a mosaic-covered rock approximately a half kilometer across. As soon as the landing party appeared on the fragment of the Lost Cardinal World, the Grey Knights sealed in their Aegis armor and Greyfax in an armored void suit, the Inquisitor sensed that Horst's psychic beacon was stronger and that its source was located somewhere beneath her feet. But the Imperials were not alone. 
the ruins of the cathedral were also being investigated by chaos cultists, who had teleported down from the frigate, and whose void suits were outfitted with imagery intended to mimic the forms of demons, who were known to be the servants of Zinch, the Lord of Change. Greyfax, seeing no point in negotiation, ordered the Grey Knights to eliminate the cultists, who quickly fell to their storm bolters and nemesis force halberds, and to Greyfax's use of her potent aura of oppression ability. The few remaining cultists were ultimately purged by the flames of one of the Grey Knight's battle brothers incinerators. With the cultists eliminated as competition for whatever lay beneath the ruined portion of the cathedral, Greyfax and her Grey Knights proceeded down a flight of winding stairs into the devastated structure's undercroft, where they discovered that a portion of it was protected by a force field that sealed in a breathable atmosphere. Within the breathable bubble, of the Undercroft was a mausoleum dedicated to the Imperial Saint Carthage. But a sudden psychic pulse from within its walls matched the beacon convinced Greyfax to have the Grey Knights force an entryway through the stone. Within the mausoleum, the Imperials discovered an ornate sarcophagus inscribed with the symbol of the Inquisition on one end. The crypt was otherwise bare. Within the sarcophagus lay an armored suit, the battle plate of a Grey Knight paladin. As soon as the sarcophagus was opened, a psychic blast overwhelmed Greyfax, and to her utter astonishment, the armor within sat up, introducing itself telepathically as Inquisitor Phineas Falconot Horst. But Horst was no longer alive. He removed the paladin's armor's helmet to reveal an undead, fleshless skull with glowing eyes. The jaw worked silently as he communicated mind to mind. Despite her distrust of Horst's undead form, Greyfax explained to him how the galaxy had been divided by the Great Rift, and that the Imperium was under assault by the forces of Chaos and the Xenos as never before. She explained their mission was to recover the Eye of Night, as one small step on a road to defeating the foes of the Emperor. Horst proved vague as to explain how he had come to his present state, claiming no memory of what had happened or for how long he had been trapped in the sarcophagus, though it had been at least several standard centuries. Horst also didn't know the location of the Eye of Night, but he didn't know who did. Moriana the Crone, an ancient human seer of the Chaos Gods, who saw all that transpired in the realm of Chaos from her lair within the Eye of Terror. It was Moriana, Horst claimed, who had guided Abaddon to the Eye of Night before the Gothic War and would also know its current location. As Horst finished his explanation, Justkar Grinheim recognized the armor Horst had inhabited as originally belonging to the paladin Bellicus, a Grey Knight known to him. The undead Inquisitor hastily dismissed the Justicar's observation, as they had more important matters to attend. And Greyfax agreed. They had a journey into the Eye of Terror to undertake. Horst led Greyfax and her Grey Knight's escort aboard the Malleus Rex to a swamp-covered world on the edge of the Eye of Terror. As they trudged through the stinking decay of the marsh, Horst explained that Moriana served the Chaos Gods directly and possessed no mortal ambitions of her own, which left her untrusted, even by Abaddon and the other forces of Chaos. Greyfax noted that it was rumored amongst the Holy Ordos that Moriana was once of the Ordo Malleus, but Horst shook his skeletal head. He explained that Moriana was older than any of the Ordos of the Inquisition and dated back to the time of the Horus Heresy. The Imperial Party suddenly came under assault from Moriana's demonic guards, who had taken on physical forms shaped from the stone and plant matter of the swamp itself. The demons proved little hindrance to the Inquisitors and the Grey Knights, though Horst cautioned that the entire demon world they now walked upon was nothing more than an artificial reality sculpted by Moriana's whim from the frothing psychic energies of the warp. Suddenly, from the miasma of the swamp ahead of them rose something that looked much like a giant stalagmite, decorated around its circumference with many of the symbols of the traitor legions, all given to Moriana as tribute by those warbands of Chaos Space Marines seeking the crone's guidance from the Dark Gods. A gash-like opening a few meters above the swamp water provided a wary entryway for the servants of the Emperor. Within the small cave created by the opening, they found Moriana, a wizened crone, dressed in ragged green robes, who was busy scrimshawing a wand made by two entwined Eldar figures, whose mouths were open in frozen terror. The Chaos Seer promised to tell the servants of the Corpse Emperor whatever they wished to know. 
Greyfax, as was her way, immediately threatened the ancient priestess with death. But Moriana replied that she did not possess the Eye of Night, but could tell the Imperials where it could be found. When Greyfax suspiciously asked why the crone, a servant of the Runa's powers, would help the servants of the Emperor, Moriana replied that she did so for obvious reasons. It served her own purposes. Mischievously, the old priestess noted that she was surprised to see the undead Inquisitor Horst, expressing disbelief that the servant of the corpse emperor had become prone to taking up necromancy. Greyfax was incensed by the accusation and promised Moriana in a fit of anger that it was not a question of whether she was going to die. Only how? Justicar Genhein found Greyfax's increasing threats of death to be counterproductive for their mission. Through the Vox, Genhein argued with Greyfax, telling her the crone would simply willingly die before she gave up the necessary information, and that she should stop wasting their time with threats. Instead, Greyfax should simply ask what the priestess wanted from them in return for her cooperation. When Moriana slyly responded that she would only answer the Imperial's questions if Greyfax asked nicely, the Puritan Inquisitor nearly killed her on the spot before Horst telepathically reminded her that her duty to the Emperor came before her own righteousness, and that if she acted otherwise, she would be a disgrace to her own Ordo. Greyfax responded that she was disgusted by the idea of sacrificing the ideas that held the Imperium together and kept its people pure for the sake of momentary gain. But Horst only mocked her for her self-righteous pretension in return. The undead Inquisitor explained cynically that nothing now held the Imperium together. It was but the tattered remnants of what the Master Mankind had forcibly welded into a single entity 10,000 standard years before. It was their purpose as his servants and inquisitors, to seek to build something better, rather than just prop up the Imperium's rotting corpse. Somewhat chastised by her fellow inquisitor, Greyfax realized that Moriana wanted her to attack, to give the hag a reason not to cooperate. So, Greyfax swallowed her pride, and asked Moriana, very politely, to tell her where the Eye of Night was located. The crone responded that her companion, Horst, had already recovered the Eye of Night, while well, he was still alive. Horst immediately denied the allegations, and Moriana realized from his denials that the undead Horst did not remember a prior encounter between them several Terran centuries earlier. Greyfax interjected, somewhat gleefully, that if Horst truly held the Eye of Night, then she no longer needed Moriana alive. Horst was confused by the crone's accusations, however. He finally confessed he had no recollection of how or when he had died. Moriana proved more forthcoming in the wake of this revelation. Crone explained that she needed Greyfax and the Imperials to reclaim the Eye of Night, for a demon prince guarded the tower where the artifact now resided. A demon prince who had taken from Moriana, but had not settled his debt, and she now intended to use the servants of the Emperor as her personal executioners. With her every instinct screaming not to, Greyfax reluctantly accepted the Crone's bargain and asked for the location of the tower. Instead, fearing that once she gave up the information, Greyfax would kill her, Moriana decided to instead conjure up a guide to lead the Imperials to where the Eye of Night lay. Horst explained that while he had no memory of how he died, he must have met Moriana before and cut the same bargain. But in that case, he had obviously failed to complete the mission and claim the Eye. As they prepared to leave, Greyfax promised to return and slay Moriana, no matter what the outcome of their quest. But the old seer promised that if the Inquisitor tried, she would be the one to fall. Disgusted, Greyfax left Moriana's cave behind, realizing that she had already crossed the line that had left a blot upon her once pristine soul. Aboard a Thunderhawk gunship requisitioned by the Malleus Rex, Greyfax, Horst, and the Grey Knights made their way to the unknown demon world. They were protected from the demonic forces of the Eye of Terror by the Aegis bubble created by their own potent Psyker minds, and were guided all the way to Moriana's demonic familiar, an impish blob of green and blue flame. Greyfax found herself tortured by the idea that she was going into battle alongside a servant of the arch enemy, and could not think of a way to adequately purge her soul of the sin. Once the Imperials passed through the upper atmosphere of the demon world, their guide had directed them to, they discovered that its surface was dominated by a great black thorn of a tower that seemed to briefly shimmer like a crystal. The imp of flame called it Vastigard, 
the Pillar of Spite fulfilled, along with several other equally welcoming names. The Thunderhawk moved towards the spire lower on the tower, and the gunship came under attack by a mass of flying demons, clearly in the surface of Zinch. Moriana's impish familiar directed the Thunderhawk through the horde of Neverborn to a parapet wide enough for the gunship to land. The rounds of the Grey Knight's transport heavy bolters had been anointed with the blood of Imperial Saints, which proved anathema to the demons, blasting their flaming bodies into immaterial mists. Once the Thunderhawk had touched down, Greyfax led the undead Inquisitor and the fully armored Grey Knights out into the waiting demonic horde, bringing down Neverborn with each blast of her condemner bolter and slash of her power sword. After carving their way through the demons, Greyfax and her companions enter the tower through a nearby portcullis, led by Moriana's chattering familiar. The remaining demons were happy to leave them be, as what lay within the tower promised a fate far worse than whatever their tender mercies could deliver. The interior of the pillar proved to be a twisted labyrinth, the only reality within that which the Imperials brought with them and protected within their ever-present Aegis bubble of psychic energy. Horst confessed he had a vague familiarity with the tower, but could remember nothing concrete about it. But the undead Inquisitor's memory was jogged as they entered a region of the pillar that encompassed a vast space, a hall with a floor, walls, and ceiling, yet clouds impossibly circled the countless pillars on high while purple gas lay underfoot. Horst finally remembered coming to the tower with Paladin Bellicus, the man whose armor he now wore after his own squad of Grey Knights had fallen because Moriana had refused to give them any aid. At that moment, the Vista of the Hall slogged off to reveal a hellish scene of human figures writhing in agony, tortured by horned demons upon every device ever designed by the human mind to inflict pain. Upon closer inspection of the gruesome vision, Greyfax realized that her own image was among the agonized multitude. It was then that they met the ruling demon of the Dark Tower, and he was dressed in the armor of an Imperial Inquisitor. There was one small difference, however. In place of his eyes, there was only black, festering pits. The undead Horst, finally regaining the full range of his memories, explained the demon prince had possessed his body at their last encounter, and in desperation, the Inquisitor had projected his own soul into his accompanying paladin's body, to cast himself back to the psychic beacon he had left behind on Savavin. But the demon prince claimed the undead Inquisitor was a liar, and that Horst was the true creature of darkness who had fooled Greyfax. Moriana's fiery familiar suddenly danced above the demon prince, egging the Imperials on to destroy Horst's eyeless, possessed body. The undead Inquisitor pleaded with them not to, claiming that if his companions destroyed the demon, they would also destroy his mortal shell condemning him to undeath forever. Instead, Horst believed there was another way. By combining the powers of their minds, the Imperials, psychers all, could drive the demon prince from the body it was using as a shield and allow his essence to reclaim it. Agreeing to Horst's ploy, the Imperials cast their mind out beyond their bubble of reality into the Immaterium, the Grey Knights merging their life energies into one as they faced the demon purely on the psychic plane. Behind them came Greyfax, maintaining the potent Aegis shield around their souls, while the spectral Horst confronted the powerful demon prince, who had stolen his mortal shell. But Horst proved unable to defeat his opponent and reclaim his body. He was cast, alongside the other Imperials, back into their bubble of reality, forced to become corporal once more. The demon still inhabited the corpse of Horst, while the Inquisitor remained trapped in the armor of the paladin Bellicus, defeated. Horst gave Greyfax permission to destroy his body and end the fight. Greyfax wasted no time in unleashing her contender bolter upon the demon prince, even as it promised them endless secrets of power if they allowed it to live. Greyfax finally used her power sword to behead it and silent its insulting offers. At the same moment, Horst's own animated war plate also collapsed to the ground. His soul apparently fled to the warp, at last with the loss of his tie to the physical realm. But within its broken skull, Greyfax uncovered a black gem the size of her fist, surrounded by a haze of darkness, the Eye of Night. Moriana had been right in her own scheming way. Horst had indeed carried the artifact with him all along. 
Greyfax placed the eye within a psychically warded casket on her belt and left with the Grey Knights to return to the Imperium and present the prize to the Primarch. Moriana's demonic familiar had already departed, and though the Inquisitor briefly felt a sense of victory despite Horst's sacrifice, it was quickly squelched by the knowledge of the choices she had made. There was a blot upon her soul that could never be erased, but she would continue to place her faith and hope of salvation in the Emperor despite her sins. For the Emperor protects. Well, I hope you liked this box, and if you did, please like, follow, comment, and subscribe. And if you really enjoyed the show, feel free to join our membership program on our Spotify channel or YouTube channel called Tales of Asheraka. Have a great day. And as always, <clears throat> until next time, this is Ekthar, signing off. Thank <laughs> you.